Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Oriana, who has had a, quite a journey uh, to get here, apparently. <laughs> 25 hours from Europe to here, which is longer than normal. Um, but I'm very pleased to have her here. Um, she got her PhD from the University of Helsinki um, and is now working as a researcher at uh, ETH Zurich and is going to talk to us about some of the work that she's been doing. So, yeah. Oriana. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here today. So good morning to all of you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Anzer, which is a personal system for data management. And uh, I will give through Anzer a sample of my vision of personal cloud uh, computing. So let me start first with the story behind this and what I have been doing in, in the last two years. So if we look at the notion of personal computer, and how this has been changing over time for, for, for users, we can identify at least two major changes that have fundamentally changed this notion. Uh, the first one is the rise of smartphones. These devices are not just communication tools, but they also integrate uh, reasonably powerful computation capabilities, sensors. They also provide various communication uh, technologies. So they can actually be used even independently of the phone networks in so-called self-organizing ad hoc networks. And for a large majority of users, today, the primary personal computer is the mobile phone. There is a second change that is modifying again the notion of personal computer, and this is happening right now. And I believe it's going to be increasingly evident in the future. And this is the rise of cloud computing, utility computing, and trends like this, where now our mobile devices have the capabilities to rent on the fly virtual machines as well as raw storage resources from providers like Amazon EC2, S3, and so forth. So in my uh, postdoc research uh, at ETH in the last two years and a half, I have been following this evolution uh, through various projects. I have been working on distributed systems for the support of personal application, uh, ranging from small scale ad hoc networks up to cloud computing infrastructures. And in doing this, my focus has been on mobile phone platforms, understanding which new applications can be enabled on these platforms, and what are the challenges involved in programming them and making them part of larger systems. Um, so to give you very quickly some samples of this research, at the beginning, I was um, exploring um, the usage of, of mobile phones independently of the phone networks in very small scale ad hoc networks. And the focus was particularly on supporting uh, social networking applications. So we built a platform running on mobile phones for programming uh, social networking applications running in wireless networks using just Wi-Fi ad hoc uh, communication. And we built services like uh, present service, voice over IP, uh, video, and, uh, and, and games like, uh, like Quake. Then I, I started working on cloud computing and moved towards analyzing the interaction between the phone and the cloud in the client server setup. And with this project, Alfredo, um, the main focus is on understanding how we can turn mobile phones into universal interface to access cloud applications. And the main uh, goal of this project is to um, build a platform that allows for a single usage model where you can on the fly acquire the client side of an application running in the cloud, configure it, interact with this application, and then discard it after the interaction. And the advantage is that the application is organized in a modular fashion so that dynamically several tiers of the application can be distributed between the client and the server side um, in a flexible and customizable way. But I then move forward in this and, and, and move now to even further in the evolution of the notion of personal computer 
with my vision of personal cloud computing. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, if I go back to the question, what's the equivalent of the personal computer in the age of cloud and mobile computing? My answer to this is that this single thing uh, is now a collection that spans physical own devices, like your phone, your, your home PC, your office PC, your laptop, as well as a dynamic collection of virtual machine storage resources that can be acquired dynamically. And this is what I call the personal cloud. And uh, what I'm seeking to, um, to um, <coughs> achieve is a new model for programming phone applications, where the phone is going to act as a controller of your personal distributed application running across this personal cloud. So a, a simple case of execution could be you have the application interface running on, on the phone, you have your data stored on the home server, mm -hmm. and then some of the computation tasks may be parallelized on, on cloud VMs. So in the Rizoma project, um, we are investigating the challenge to build a software platform that can al allow for the programming of personal cloud applications. And uh, by we, I mean um, from the faculty side, Timothy Rosco and PH two PhD students, Chin Yin and Ershan Ukan, that I'm supervising with Mathi, and a variable number of master's students, uh, Dejan and Robert, were advised by me in the last six months. Um, so to achieve this, this challenge to build this platform, um, these are the three main focus areas on which we are uh, working on. So first of all, uh, providing routing in, in personal clouds. Uh, in doing this, one of the main challenges is to deal with the heterogeneity of the, of the devices involved. And uh, the key insight of the research we are doing in this area is to uh, use concepts from declarative networking to represent the heterogeneity of this environment and, and to reason about this um, uh, through very <coughs> declarative description of your routing request. Um, the second aspect we are working on is how to support uh, self-managing computing applications in personal clouds. So uh, the goal is to allow applications to start running on the personal cloud and then self-maintain depending on device failures, changing on, on the load, changing on the requirements so that the application itself can self-manage, acquire extra resources, release other, and, and, and migrate code from um, devices. And the third aspect is about data replication. And this is uh, the focus of, uh, of my talk today with, uh, with Anzer. So, um, Anzer um, seeks to achieve uh, a problem that you may have encountered in your everyday life. So, let's look at this scenario. So, a user has some personal devices like this, and sometimes he takes photos with his camera. Whenever he gets back home or he remembers, he copies these photos to his own PC. Sometimes he takes photos with his phone, and whenever he's in proximity of a more powerful device, he moves the photos to this other device. Or sometimes it just takes photos and forgets about uh, replicating them. So this is a very common uh, pattern for many users, and this is true for uh, photos, but also for many other personal data, like music collections, uh, contact information, documents. And it is common that users have to deal with a data distribution of this type. And behind this data distribution, there is a very complicated and intricate set of requirements that users uh, try to enforce. For example, I want to make sure that uh, when I leave for my next trip, my camera does not have photos, so my memory is empty. Or if I have uh, data on my mobile devices, I want to have a backup on a fixed device or I want to make sure that my private items do not get stored on a public PC. The problem is that in enforcing these requirements, users today uh, just uh, use ad hoc and, and sort of manual um, 
uh, and manual approach. So the goal of this work is to try to make this more automatic and much easier uh, for the user himself. So a possible uh, solution to deal with uh, personal data replication is to use uh, online service providers, Facebook, Google, Flickr. They are very f uh, popular and they definitely offer many advantages, but they also come with uh, serious drawbacks, um, like loss of privacy and control, um, lock-in with a specific provider, as well as uh, vulnerability to provider failures and insolvency. So instead, what we want to achieve is a personal system for managing data. And this system must be able to preserve this growing body of, of personal data and, and make the data available according to various user preferences. For example, recently downloaded music on a device I carry, at least you distributed copies of my photos and so forth. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to refer to this setup as a personal storage network, and I will address the user preferences through replication policies that a user can express to control uh, the data distribution. The challenges involved in, in building this system are different from the focus of typical online uh, centralized solutions. So the scale is not on throughput or scale, but is more on policy flexibility, how flexible are the policies I can support, um, how to handle the heterogeneity of the device ensemble, how to cope with a changing set of devices um, that can fail, can move around, but also think of the case you buy a new phone and this phone has to be integrated in your personal storage network. Um, and then we have to deal with limited storage resources, again, for example, on phones, and one of the major requirements that users want to have guaranteed is data durability. So I will show how we address these challenges uh, in the rest of the talk. This is a very hot topic at the moment in the research community, but industry as well. Um, so first of all, there are um, several synchronization tools that can be used, uh, Live Mesh, uh, Dropbox, um, the, probably the, the closest systems to, to ANZER are uh, systems for content-based partial replication, um, Symbiosis from Microsoft and Perspective from CMU are two examples. The main idea of these systems is to provide an interface where users can specify uh, content-based filters. For example, I want uh, five-star rating music on, on my mobile phone the filter gets associated to a specific uh, device. And then there is research on device transparency, partial replication, flexible consistency. So in ANZER, we look at these existing techniques and we try to fill the gap between these systems. Uh, so in particular, what ANZER um, does is to expand the expressivity of the replication policies that can be supported, but at the same time does not sacrifice the tractability of the policy evaluation and the scalability um, of it. And I'll show this uh, in a moment. So to summarize um, ANZER, so ANZER is a system for policy-based replication in personal storage networks and replicates data according to flexibly specified user policies. Uh, it reacts to ch devices that enter. Yes? So, can you just tell me what the substrate is for replication? Are we assuming that the cloud is like a distributed, conceptually like a distributed file system server and all the clients are caches? Are you doing more of a peer to peer model where any device exchanges with a device, a hybrid of the two? How, how is the data replicated? What's the mechanism? Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to answer this in the rest of the talk, but okay. to give you a very quick answer now, for us the cloud is just something where you can acquire a virtual machine and you will copy there some code uh, that can run or, or some data that is going to be stored there. So it's, it's acquired and then it's part of our overlay. Okay. And it's an overlay that is a, it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer network if you want to put it like that. 
but there are there is some centralization too in the system. But this will I will get back to that with the architecture. Okay. Is it okay? Um, so uh, it autonomously reacts to devices that change and, and, and leave the system. It dynamically can acquire cloud resources if there is an advantage in integrating them in, in the personal storage network. It ensures data durability, scales to a very large number of data items, and minimizes the cost for uh, policy enforcement. So I'm now going to start to go into the details of the system and how it has been uh, built. Starting from the very basic concept of how policies are defined and built. So I like systems like Symbiosis and, 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 and Perspective. Um, Anzer supports device neutral policies, which means that policies are specified based on device predicates rather than names. So a logical predicate that refers to a device. So instead of saying something like replicate photos to my home server, um, Anzer supports something like ensure at least one copy of every photo exists on a, a fixed server I own. Or another example could be make items modified in the last hour accessible at no more than one minute latency from the phone. So this is the predicate that define the device rather than using a specific name. And the advantage of doing this is that these kind of policies can work across a changing set of device set because they are not bound to specific device and can also automatically apply to new devices. So if I go back to the case I, I mentioned before, I buy a new phone. Well, this phone will be automatically integrated in the system and policy will start automatically um, uh, be working for this device. And potentially, these kind of policies can even be reused by, by other users. Yes? So one of the interesting things about policy-based systems is that it's really easy to write impossible to satisfy policies. <laughs> uh, so. Yes, that's a very good point. <laughs> so um, I'll be to that in, in two slides. Yeah. Um, so first of all, let me first introduce how the policies are implemented and then I'll get to uh, what you ask. Um, so we use a policy stratification, which means, um, first of all, automatically the system collects uh, item, the data items, metadata, and device metadata. So these are just uh, key value pairs that describe the data items stored in the system and the devices available. For example, I will have something like type size, modified data, a tag that says if the data is private or public, and so forth. And this is automatically gathered from the applications. Then, based on this metadata, item and device predicates are defined. For example, a photo item predicate returns all the items that have type JPEG, as well as for uh, device predicates. And you can think that these item and device predicates are then made available in a built-in library in Anzer. So now the user can come and specify policies. So the policy is basically an item predicate, a device predicate, and a relation that must hold between the two. So a photo item should be on any device, rep any, so at least one replica. So you see this stratification that starts from the metadata predicates, and then the policy. Now, in Anzer, all this is implemented in uh, expressing logic programming in, in Prolog. So these are basically Prolog facts, and these are inference rules. And the user is, is working at this, this level in specifying policies. So why logic programming? As it, it has been shown in, in previous systems, um, logic programming allows to unify information from it in a heterogeneous set of sources and makes the system less bound to a specific schema. So it becomes easier to evolve the system, integrate new metadata, uh, new content that appears in the system and new devices. So by doing this, the advantage is that the expressivity of the policy language can be expanded enormously. So here is another example of a more complex policy where basically we have again an item predicate 
that will return all the items that have been modified in the last hour. Then I have a device predicate that gives all the devices that are closed to this um, mobile phone within a 60 uh, milliseconds. And then there is the relation rep any. So make at least um, one copy of it. Yes? How diverse do you expect these policies to be? Are common users going to sh just share some normal policies and go with it? Or expecting people to have very specific policies individually? I think, so the way it works in, in the system is that we, so in, in a built-in library, you will have device predicates and item predicates. And then based on that, you can combine. So, but these device predicates and, and item predicates can also be extended as well and maintained by a developer. So I expect that user uh, may have, you know, some fixed number of policies that may last for years and that are pretty simple, right? Make two copies of this item. Or, but then I think that there are also situation where a user may specify even temporary policy, right? Like something like this where I say um, my documents um, tag in this specific way modified in the last two hours have to be copied to this device because maybe I'm leaving for a trip and I want to get a backup. Or I will show actually in the experiments an example of a temporary policy. So I think there are both things. So there is the boring side, but also the more uh, exciting uh, composition. You had another question? So I was just, I, I'm curious about uh, the constraints that have a lot of inherent variability. Like, within 60 seconds, my phone changes a lot, even walking around MSR. Mm -hmm. Right now, my phone has no internet access because it doesn't have 3G. Yeah. Uh, Seems like um, really interesting things to try and to try and work in with the system. Yeah. So is that something you handle, or do you kind of assume these things? You mean the variability? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, that comes from the networking layer of Anzer. So, in the current implementation, it's very simple. We try to make sure that when you detect an event, you make sure that it's a permanent change that the system has to, to which the system has to react. But you can then built in any sort of uh, logic in, in how you describe these events. And the most uh, important thing is to detect them, represent them, and, and then uh, have a reaction to them when they, they are there. But yeah, the system can become very unstable. <laughs> OK. So now, this is good. We can express a lot of policies. And now I go back to your question. But does this actually? Uh, work because we have then to process them. So in processing them, uh, we use um, constraint logic programming. So we, we basically specify policies in the actual implementations as an optimization problem. And the constraints of this problem are given by the policies themselves. For you say, I want two replicas of items are imposed by the device constraints, for example, keep two gigabytes of free memory on the mobile phone. Then there is an, obje an objective function that comes uh, from, for example, I want to minimize the bandwidth needed to transfer data in order to enforce the policies, or I want to maximize uh, data accessibilities. So I have constraints, I have an objective function, this translates in a constraint optimization problem. And the advantage with CLP is that um, it offers a natural way to specify these constraints, and it's basically a satisfaction problem that very well applies to this kind of um, situation. But to be more concrete about how this works, let me give you some insights on, on, on the actual uh, CLP execution. So I'll start with the basic approach. So the model behind the CLP execution is a matrix model, where we have a bunch of of devices available in, in the overlay. Yes? Are you treating all data as equal in the sense that you use the notion of hotness of objects or things you know, you've know you done in the recent past, you're much more likely to access them versus something that's really old and you can say that even though you don't have it probably available, you're willing to tolerate some delay or you may want to cache some objects that you have you know, 
most frequently acts as sort of the policies that sort of you know, adapt themselves to sort of mark mess of your data or how frequently you answer your items? Um, yeah, that's very interesting. So I've never thought about it actually, but you can um, you can build this with the current uh, framework of the system. It, it all depends on the item metadata that you specify. So I could have a, a, a metadata that says number of access per, per second, right, or per hour, whatever. So I can just have that metadata. And then there will be a device, uh, sorry, an item predicate that is going to say frequently access item. And you, you give as an input the frequency of access. And in this way, you are defining which items have been frequently accessed, and then a policy can be built on top of that. So this is exactly the advantage of logic programming. You can just specify one more parameter. So you just de define one of these metadata here. It's going to be added, so it's going to be available as a fact in the system. Then an inference rule has to be added that just reason about this. And this will be in this built-in library. And then a policy can use that. So this, this is the extensibility that uh, logic programming gives you. Do I answer your question? Okay. So, um, so there is this matrix model, devices and all the data items in the system. Now, the solution to the problem is the value that this cell takes. Could be a one, which means store the item there, or a zero, do not store it there. In order to, um, to find a solution, constraints are imposed. So constraints coming from replication policies make at least two copies of item four, and constraints that come from the device um, specific features, like I want two gigabyte of free memory on my phone. So by imposing these constraints, some values of these sets we are will be already determined and some will still be undecided. So there is then a second set of constraints that, have to, that has to be imposed in order to um, support the optimization uh, part of the problem. Indeed, so imagine you have a current data distribution that says this is where my data is stored and you have policies that have to be imposed. In order to impose th those policies, you need to pay a cost that will be the bandwidth that has to be used to transfer data so that the new configuration satisfy the policies. So constraints are imposed in order to minimize that cost so that the optimal data distribution can be found that is the one that has the minimum cost from these uh, two matrices. And once the matrix has been decided, an execution plan will be output that consists of copy and delete actions. For example, copy item two from the phone to the home PC, delete item two on the phone. And then the system will enforce uh, these, these actions. Yes? Give me a sense of what the cost is of satisfying for finding this global mapping of objects to devices in time. I mean, how does it grow with the number of objects? If I have 100,000 objects in my system, is it, is it quite slow to calculate this? So, here it is. Yes. The answer is yes, a lot. <laughs> so, this is um, the CLP execution time versus the number of items. And uh, w this was done with three different data sets uh, generated from different uh, random seeds. And the brute force is the algorithm I just shown that reasons item by item. With 25 items, in hours, it could not complete. Not only that, but you see that it's also very dependent on the data sets, right? There are sweet spots coming from different, depending on the data sets. So this is a problem. Yes? So I'm a little confused on what software you're running here. Are you, are you running Prolog and then your own constraint solver? Or are you running a particular constraint language? So we are using Prolog and we are using the Eclipse Solver. And this runs, will become clearer when I show the architecture. There is one node in the system that holds the knowledge base and the CLP solver runs, determine which are the actions that have been taken and dispatch the actions to the devices. But I'll show the architecture later. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. So 
formulation doesn't take into account the cost of doing the operations, the copy costs, or anything else like that? No, it does not. Um, so is there, is there any way to take that into account? You know, obviously, so doing something on a phone is probably more expensive than doing it on a Oh, I, I see and, what and, you mean. And, and yeah. you know, maybe the trade-offs would be a little yeah. different. Yeah, definitely. Could. That's a good point. I mean, it should be done. And also the possibility to maybe aggregate actions and, and yes, we don't reason about that yet. We do, to be really honest, we do one thing in the system that is again another advantage of Prolog, that is simply to order the devices. But just ordering them in the way we specify them, if I have the option between copying, for example, I have a data that is stored on the phone and my office PC, and I need to make a third copy in the cloud. So the system will always choose the Office PC to copy the data instead of choosing the phone. So there is this implicit, if you want, optimization just ba based on the order of the priority of devices. But it's not very detailed as you probably mean. I think it could be interesting to do that and aggregate actions and, uh, and things like that. Especially we had situations where we, um, we got something like thousands of actions to execute in one go. So that kind of optimization becomes uh, very important. Yes? What if the new distribution is not feasible? You have constraints that you still cannot satisfy. There is no solution. There is no solution, but then it depends what is the reason why it can't be satisfied. So if you had a policy um, that was something like um, make photos available on my home server, my home server is not reachable. That policy can't be satisfied. So you said that one phone photos to be available in one minute in phones, but the memory requirements in the phones are such that you cannot. Well, then if we can, that, so if you know a priori that that policy can't be satisfied because the device, for example, home server is not reachable or because the phone does not have a connectivity or if you know a priori, that policy is just excluded from the set. So this won't make CLP failing. But if you don't know, it's going to give no solution because there is no solution to the problem. And one, one, one way to deal with that is that if there is no solution, what you could start doing is to start uh, solving a subset of the policies and see if at least a subset of those policies can be satisfied. But if there is no solution, uh, the CLP will simply return you no solution. Like, the user to change the policy, like there is a feedback. Yes, so the user is informed when a policy can't be satisfied. So the user basically specifies policies, constraints, and get back a feedback. So from the feedback, the user will know what has not been um, enforced. Yes? Where is the policy evaluation done? I, I, I sense that you don't want to tell us yet, but I, I'm curious. It's in the CLP. So it's, it's one node that is elected as a leader and runs the, the Eclipse That's solver. The Sorry. Is that the cloud? It can be. Okay. It's, it's one device that is elected as a leader. So it can be your office PC, but if there is no office PC, it won't be the phone. So we don't run that on the phone. But it has to be a node with global knowledge of all of the of everything. Yeah. So the knowledge base has to be stored there, but I'll show later really, because then it's also distributed. The, the so, so the user selects one device and forever that device is going to be used as the, the knowledge base and the policy? Well, okay. forever if it does not fail. Okay. If it fails, there will be a new, the election protocol will elect a new leader. Yes? Just tell me a little bit why you chose to do a global uh, policy rather than a device-based policy. I mean, traditionally, like Coda had boarding policies, and other other storage systems that have looked at personal storage networks have done have things like Affinity, mm -hmm. but usually per client. I, I, I can see a trade-off here. If you have a lot of churn in your system, you're adding and moving devices quick, quickly. This might be better because it's calculated a global policy. But I'm curious about why you, why you chose this approach instead of something that's just more stringent. Next slide. <laughs> You, you are always ahead of me. <laughs> no, sorry. Well, the, the quick answer is, so far, centralization has been a, hasn't not been a problem. In the sense that the, the set of devices is still small, and I show now that we can still scale. So that, that's the quick answer. But then I have a lot of future work on what you are saying, because 
in a multi-user model, you, you need more distribution. My worry is that in a, in a device model, I have to change the policies per device, which is slowly changing. But in a global model, I have to change my policy per data item. You know, if I'm creating a lot of content, every time I create a new item, I have to evaluate globally whether that item needs to be replicated across different devices, recalculate my schedule, and it might cause a lot of traffic in the system. But, so that, I'm not sure I'm understanding, but um, when you specify, why, why do you need to specify a policy for every new item you create? Because also items are addressed by the item predicates. So if you say recent item, in the moment in which a new item is created, created is part of that class. But so it's, it's device items. independent, but it's also item independent, the policy. Because you know, once when an item is created, you don't know whether or not it should exist on these other devices unless you look to the schedule. So you're worried about reevaluating the same policy over and over. Yes. Right? I mean, we can talk about. We can talk about yeah, I think we should talk about offline. I'm not sure I'm understanding. Uh, or maybe it will come now with the more complication of equivalence classes. So basically, it does not scale this basic approach. So we introduce the item equivalence classes. And the purpose of doing this is to reduce the problem space so that the CLP solver can converge to a solution quicker. Now, it's important to understand the equivalence classes are generated by looking at the item predicates in the set of active policies. So assume that there is just one policy, and this is the item predicate that is used. The equivalence classes are given by the permutation, music item, non-music item. And all items can be grouped under these two equivalence classes. Or if you add two item predicates in the active policies, then you will have four equivalence classes that says recent music item, not recent, and, and so forth. So by generating the equivalence classes, then all items can be grouped according to them. So in the previous matrix model, instead of the items, the CLP program will reason about equivalence classes. And this makes the system scaling much better. So this is the previous graph, and this is the new um, execution time with the equivalence classes algorithm. And even on a larger scale, you can see that um, even when processing 10,000 items, the solution is found in, in less than 10 seconds. So with equivalence classes, it can scale very well with the number of items. And we got what we wanted because now the system scale with the policy's complexity because it depends on the equivalence classes. Yes? If you, but if you have a rule saying, uh, I can't have more than two gigabytes on this device, now you can't have equivalence classes because any two files that have different sizes are, are no longer equivalent. So you, so you now, just having that, that policy, I care about the aggregate storage requirements of, the, of a set of items, means that you can no longer uh, consider any two items equivalent. Unless you, they have exactly the same size. Well, so the, the way you implement that kind of constraints is by defining a predicate that we say item store on device or item not, do not store. So that's the, the equivalence class that you use. And then you reason about that in the same way. So it's again a property, right? The device has a property. The item has a property that is stored on a device. So in that way, you can still define an equivalence class that will group all the items that have the property to be stored on device X or on device epsilon. How would you choose a subset of items that can fit on the device? I think it might be what Jay is asking. So one, one thing, one, so the, the only case that I have found so far where equivalence classes may not be efficient uh, is the case where, I mean, this particular situation where I need to make a copy of the items and they can't fit on my mobile phone or they can't fit on one unique device. So I would like to split that, those devices that belong to one equivalence classes in two, right? So that then I can copy. But yes, that's the only case where I don't yet manage to handle, but I think that's actually pretty rare because if you think you have a cloud machine or it becomes pretty rare the case where you need to split your, your traffic. But for the rest, you can uh, reconduct always to an equivalence class. Yes. 
I think he was. So, um, as my understanding is, prologue or the CLP type of software is pretty poor in terms of kind of like continuous errors. If you specify something with time, and say I, I care about things with between this time of the day and that time of the day, or every Monday or something like that. Uh, it's, it's fairly hard. I think this is similar to the, the font size, for example. Anything that's this like a real value variable become very hard to reason about. Um, so, I'm curious, do you have experience in terms of specifying things with time size? Yes, we we did that and. Actually, it's in the previous example. I, I'm thinking because so far I did not have a problem with time. So I'm thinking where there could be, oh, sorry, it was actually in the example, where there could be a limitation in doing that. So here, for example, this recent item, the predicate, is defined by having the modified date that is um, the metadata of the item. And then this modified within is a predicate um, implement, it's an inference rule in Prolog that gets the current time and, and computes whether it's before or after the... Um, you have to evaluate every second? Every well, second. every time. So the CLP, the CLP solver runs periodically. So whenever it runs, it will get the fresh time and will evaluate. So it's discretized based on when you involve yes, the CLP Yes, solver. that's absolutely correct. So at the moment, the CLP solver is invoked on a periodic basis. Um, we are working on making it more even driven, but for the moment, it's it's periodic trigger. On the community, right? When the next time the CLP solver should run? I think this is similar to. The well, we we have investigated the trade-off. Or do I run CLP every 30 seconds or every 10 minutes? Right? Obviously, if you run it on a shorter interval, then you can m more easily follow what is the uh, the system uh, load. It's a trade-off, but I don't see any problem in making it even driven where whenever there is an event or there is a large number, large enough number of items that have to be processed, then uh, the prolog solver will be invoked. That, that's how the system uh, should go. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes. Can you go to the last slide which we have the graph on a very simple question. Yes. Uh, uh, so I have 10 policies and 12 equivalence classes, and if my computation now, the evaluation is based on the classes of policies, why, why does it cost any, the number of items yeah. should not make a difference? Very good point, yes. So the reason why there is this increase is that there is a last phase that is where we have to expand the matrix in order to generate the actions, and that scales with the number of items. So at some point, the solution is given, and actions have to be output. And that has to be on a per-item base. So the matrix has to be expanded. So that's good, because that means if we have to move something, we don't have to move an entire equivalence class. No, I, I mean, right. I was just you reason by equivalence classes, but the actions are defined on a per-item basis. And then how, so suppose I just have something that I've already done this, and I introduce one new object. Is, is, it shouldn't take very long to reevaluate everything just for an increment. In other words, I would look for an incremental change in performance somehow, as opposed to reevaluating everything for 100,000 objects. Can I just incrementally reevaluate based on the introduction of one new object, falls into an equivalence class, I do the calculation, and I don't have to really make great changes? Should, I just have a sense there should be something. So you, what you mean is that instead of reevaluating all items every time, you should look at the difference. Yeah. This is your yes, absolutely yes. You are right. Yes. So there are a lot of optimizations that we haven't done yet. You can also reduce the number of active policies because maybe you have new items, but they do not relate to all policies. So you can reduce. Yes, there is absolutely a lot that can be done to make it even faster. Yes. Yes. Then. <laughs> I need to go on. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, we could just take the questions if, if you don't mind. so we can get a little more of the time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. 
Um, so now we have built a basic framework that allows to specify metadata and variables and, and optimize over uh, the data items that are given. And so with this basic framework, it becomes possible to start introducing new variables and reason about them. And one of these variables we investigated is that of acquirable resources, which means to factor the decision of acquiring a cloud machine or pure storage uh, in the policy process itself. So the CLP program evaluates the states that the system can achieve when a new device is added, specifically a cloud virtual machine, which means having an extra column in, the, in that matrix that I have shown. And you, you, we need to consider also price constraints. I don't want to spend more than X per month on renting cloud. And the actions that are output now will be also acquire and release actions of virtual machines. And so now the picture is complete and, and this is the, uh, the personal cloud. So I now want to give you a brief uh, overview on the, um, on the architecture of the system. Uh, so this is the architecture that runs on every node in the system for the exception of the CLP solver and the knowledge base. So this is used for optimization and all that I have presented so far basically runs here. Uh, the knowledge base is also only on one single node, but in order to avoid a point, a one um, single point of failure, it is also uh, replicated, policies and metadata are fully replicated across the devices so that the state can be reestablished in case the node holding the knowledge base will fail. Um, now this CLP, I have shown how we use it for data replication, but actually in Rizoma it is used also for networking optimization, application computation of optimization. Yes? You mean on the well provisioned machines, it's not replicated on each phone? So uh, it depends, so policies and, and item metadata are replicated everywhere. They don't, they are really a few megabytes, it's not uh, a problem. And then there are information like, uh, um, for example, sensor information that are collected that describes the state of the system and, 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 and uh, uh, device uh, properties. And these are replicated only among a selected subset of potential coordinators, potential nodes that could become the next leader in the system. So in order to build a knowledge base, there, there are a bunch of sensors that run on every device and they collect information like which network links are in use, what's the device status, memory, CPU usage, uh, what's the, the latency between any pair of device. And also, um, item metadata uh, are, are collected in the, in the same way so that the CLP can know which items are available and where they are currently stored plus external monitoring service for Planet Lab and, and EC2. Then the application will submit the replication policies. CLP will run and output copy and delete actions that are enforced by the data replication subsystem. Now, in building the data replication, uh, we reuse well-known techniques in data replication. Per, uh, in particular, for partial replication, we have an implementation, um, simplified implementation of Practi, we then use um, a similar interface to the TACT system for flexible consistency that allows to have a continuous range of consistency values, which basically means that every item in the system can be replicated with the weaker guarantees of causal consistency up to the stronger guarantees of sequential consistency. And to enforce sequential consistency, the consensus, uh, Paxos, is, is invoked. So every device is part of the Paxos consensus. Then we have actuators that are in charge of going and acquiring releasing virtual machines. And finally, there is the overlay network on where all these runs. So the overlay takes care of leader election, membership management, failure detection. And as I said at the beginning, uh, it implements concept from declarative networking to specify routing requests, again, as a CLP optimization problem, uh, which allows to deal with heterogeneous network paths, failures, or, or situations like you mentioned before, do I have a path uh, to an unstable device? OK, so now um, a few evaluation results. So we run 
um, trials of the system using a real uh, home and, and office network plus uh, virtual machines from EC2 and, and, and Planet Lab. And um, we investigated the policy sustainability. So I have shown this before, how uh, the system can scale to a large number of items. In terms of memory consumption, CLP is, is, is okay. Uh, the upper bound, for example, for um, reasoning about 10,000 items was about 64 megabytes, which is more than reasonable for um, a modern device. Then we evaluated the reactivity of the system. So in this uh, uh, first test, um, we produce in the system a dramatic event. The home server crashes. So the home server was storing something like 1,200 items. It crashes. The system will have to reason about how to um, basically reestablish the, 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 uh, the replication um, requirements in the system and decides to acquire an EC2 machine in order to create an extra replica and then start copying all the, all the data items that are available in the system so that the replica that the home server does not provide anymore can be reestablished. So this is to show how acquirable resources can help the system to stabilize and, and decrease the level of vulnerability and Anzer can autonomously go and reason about, I need an extra resource for um, satisfy the, the policies. But also, um, reactivity can be used um, to satisfy, uh, to react to mobility. So imagine this scenario. So I'm, I'm, I'm in Europe in my office network, and from my laptop I'm downloading uh, photos from my office PC with a certain access time. And then I, I, I go to Seattle, and as soon as I connect, I want again to, to go on to download my music, from my, my photos from my office PC, with, of course, an increased access time since I'm, I'm remote. Now, if a policy like the following is imposed that says, picture item modified um, within the last day should be replicated to at least one device that is fixed, and it is close to the laptop, within 100 milliseconds from the laptop. In the moment in which my laptop reconnects, the policy is in force, and CL the, the CLP program will acquire an extra machine from the cloud and start copying the photo so that my access time will be uh, greatly reduced by the time all the photos have been copied. So this goes back to your previous question, are policies permanent, dynamic? This is an example of a policy that you could establish just for a temporary time and then delete from the system once I'm back to Europe. And acquirable resources can also be used for improved performance. Now, um, if I'm okay with... Yes? So that brings up an interesting question. So, you know, suppose I didn't want to write that rule myself. Could it, could the developer, the provider of the system, sort of write a meta rule that says, you know, any time... I have it. Rule all the policies are... Sure, why not? I mean, one thing could be that policies could be associated to really what you are doing, right? To, you could have own policies or holiday policies, and I think that's possible. Why not? Yeah. So, if I am okay with the time, I have one minute demo. It's just to, it's nothing fancy, but shows how the system works and, and, and give you an insight. So here is the overlay that we use for most of our tests. So I have, for example, IKDS is my office PC storing three photos. Then I have uh, my mobile phone. This is my home server, also with a few photos. I made the system empty for clarity. So that's the home server. And then the laptop. And then there are some um, a Planet Lab machine and two EC2 machines. Obviously, all these devices were in Switzerland, but for your uh, visualization, I, dis I hard coded the latitude and longitude. So that's the EC2. So now I can go in the system and I can select a picture and I decide to submit this to the system. So I'm running this at the moment on this red node that is also the coordinator, the, the node that runs the CLP uh, in the system. So the, the picture is going to be now available only on that node. Now 
I go and I specify a policy. So this is a basic GUI we built to quickly specify them, but of course you are not limited to, to that GUI to, to build them. So here I say um, a picture, wrap any, home and fixed. So these are item and device predicates. So I save the policy and, and this is how it looks like. So the picture item make at least one copy on a home device that is also fixed. And I can also go and see which are the current policies that are present. So I actually add another policy that says that pictures should have at least three replicas on any device. So now you see that the policy has been replicated to all devices in the overlay. CLP runs periodically, so now it has run, and it has output two actions. Copy the item from IKDesk, my office PC, the new photo to the home server, and then the other, um, the other action is copy the photo to EC2 Europe. So I said that I want three replicas of these photos. So one is the office PC, one is the EC2 Europe, and one is indeed um, the home server. And so now you can see that the uh, four photos are, um, are now available there. So then I do another thing. I go and I take the policies, and these are the current policies I have. And now I specify an additional policy that says pictures that are private don't replicate them, replicate none to the cloud. So then I, I specify the name of the policy with a mistake, I load it. And so this is how it looks like. So this is the current set of policies that is available. So what is happening now? I had three copies, and one of them happened to be on the cloud because that's what CLP output. So by imposing this, if there are photos that are private, they have to be deleted from the cloud, but still I need to have my third replica. So indeed what you see is that there will be a copy item that will copy the photo this time to the laptop so that I still have three replicas, Plus, there will be a delete that is going to go and delete from EC2 Europe this photo that was indeed uh, a private photo. And so now um, you can see there that it has been deleted. So this is the, again the coordinator, the home server has as well four photos. The laptop has this new photo and the last one is the EC2 that now has three photos. Oh, I forgot to make this full screen. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oops. So now, um, to go back to the talk and to conclude. So, I have presented Anzer, which is a personal system for data management, and uh, it supports policy-based um, replication and can scale to a large number of items thanks to the introduction of equivalence classes. Now, this is one piece of the full system we are building, the personal cloud computer. Uh, it's the storage part. Now, what, what will be next? So first of all, uh, we have to work on the application support. Um, one, one problem there is how to partition application across the personal cloud in terms of code and data. And also, once it is partitioned and, and you can distribute pieces, uh, it needs, you need to have some coordination across the layer of data storage network, especially if there are bits of optimization going on at each of these layers. Right? I don't want to pay more than X for 3G connection. I want my photo to be stored there, and I want my application to uh, interact with this and, and, and finish before a minute. I mean, this kind of uh, interactions. And then a question that is open is, can this be used by existing applications? What's the overhead of taking an existing application and apply uh, to this? Then if we go to then uh, multiple applications, coordination across them becomes also a very hot um, issue. 
Um, the risk is that this becomes a set of autonomous systems that react to each other, you have control loop issues, and, and you have then unexpected interaction. So the, there needs to be coordination across the application. And then, uh, to go back to your initial question, so, so far we have considered a single user, user model, and it scales well. We haven't found problems in having this centralized architecture, but we are uh, considering a multi-user model where every personal cloud of each user will start interacting, data are shared, you may even share data with online services. So then a distributed policy decision becomes important that does not uh, bring to having distributed CLP, but still start making decision more uh, local to a device. And this will be very interesting. And then, uh, to really conclude, so cloud computing infrastructures today provide us almost an unlimited number of computation and, and storage resources. And on the other side, we have mobile phones that for a large majority of users are today the primary personal computer. And they already are very popular and they are going to act as an entry point to the cloud as well. So with Rizoma, um, I plan to bring together these two worlds and make the phone a controller of personal cloud applications that runs across uh, this personal cloud. So I conclude here and uh, if you have more questions or questions I haven't answered, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Yes, you, you had a question, I think, before. Yes, yeah, so I was curious about, um, so I want to push a little bit more on this idea of, of item classes instead of individual <laughs> items. If we're getting, I'm wondering if there, if there are points in the optimization space where we're going to pull out a flap, where I add an image and all my images get copied from one computer to another, and then, I, and then I add, I delete an image and they'll move back. Um, and that this could be kind of happening rapidly because I'm, Unable to reason about items individually. Um, yes, so it's it's a good point. Uh, so how stable is this, right? Because now you reason by equivalence classes. Now, in your specific example, I think that um, so one possibility is to say um, you can have. Um, equivalence classes and you can start um, sort of specifying them at the finer granularity so that you avoid also the case I was saying where I have to copy them and, and they can't be all um, uh, stored. But I think that in other cases um, if you delete an item, right, it means that that item shouldn't be stored anymore on your local device. But on the other end, you want to have a certain number of, of replicas of that item. So the system will, uh, will look at that single item by making sure that there is, um, this, there is a replica of that. So that won't bring to instability. I think the instability may be more uh, when you start having policies that change very frequently and, and then you know, it, it becomes harder to optimize and coordinate between one change to the other. I think that's one, but I haven't really investigated so uh, much. As I said, there are a lot of optimizations that could make the system much more efficient. Also, um, one thing I'm considering is starting uh, looking at what is the load that the user generates. Because if you think as a user, um, if you produce photos every 10 seconds, you're taking photos with your phone and you want to have them replicated it's very unlikely that at the same time you will produce 100 music files and 10 documents and, you know, so this means that you have sort of uh, a partition workload that comes and the policies related to those specific items should be activated at that time. So this will make the system as case match better and, and probably gives more stability. But these are things that I have still to investigate, so I don't have a proof of that. Yes? Totally other random comment, but one thing I would hope that you think about at some point, if you pursue this work um, much further, is thinking about how to automatically learn policies or learn labels for items. So the reason I say things like that is 
is um, <laughs> when I manage my own pictures, right, I have a very zero one thing. Like, I can only treat them as all pictures. I have no way of feeling any finer granularity of pictures of UW versus pictures of, of when I was seven. They're all in the same place. And just because it's too hard for me to try and separate them out. But you might think that, that you know, that some sort of machine learning guy can live on top of this and actually be able to say, well, look, you know, even though you have these pictures and you treat them all the same to you, you haven't looked at these pictures in 10 years. And yeah, yeah. while you want them to exist, we can let them sit over on that old, slow hard drive that yeah. we never care about. Um, sure. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. And at the moment, <clears throat> to say the truth, we rely on XFIF tool, so we extract metadata. If we have a user that is very careful and it has tagged all his photos, then we can do very cool things in reasoning about it. So I think that if there would be some machine learning system, right, that allows me to have more um, richer data, then yeah, the, the, the framework is there for reasoning about it. Yeah, sure. That would be cool too. <laughs> um, yes? Uh, it's the same, whatever. You can go. I was wondering how would things change if your objects become mutable? Right? So right now your notion of mutation is just deletion and, and, and copying. Right? So what if you allow updates to objects? Oh, thank you for asking this question. So I'm a big fan of the consistency model we have in the system. And so with photos and music files, after all, you don't change them that much because, I mean, exactly. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you... <laughs> Unless you change the metadata every, but still the, the file won't change. But if you start having uh, documents and stuff like that, so then it becomes very interesting. So I did not go into the details of this part of the system, but I mentioned that we use Practi as a, as a basic partial replication. And on top of that, uh, we have an arbitrary consistency. So this means that every time an item is added to the system, you can specify at which level of consistency the, system, the item should be maintained. So you can say strong consistency, which means that any update you do on that item will be propagated to all devices that have subscribed to that, which means all items that are interested in that, that have a policy that says you should have that item. Or you could specify a much uh, higher uh, consistency, so weaker, it's, you increase the level. And so then you can have even 10,000 updates that don't get uh, replicated. And at the user level, this is what we call the conit, which is that if you saw in the, in the demo, I had that little window where I put, there was a two and I put a zero, was the level of consistency. So if it's zero means strong consistency. If I put a 10, it means I can have 10 outstanding rights on this item until I run consensus and I make sure uh, it's consistent again. But I think that this is independent on the replication policies. So when I do a copy action, I make sure that subscriptions among devices are set correctly. And then if that item was a strongly consistent replicate item, the consistency layer will work on top of that. But that's independent on the replication policies. So once you got the item, you are part of the consensus for that item. Even in practice, consistency comes at a price. You can, right, so, it's, so it's not quite clear you can sort of delineate replication consistency, right? Because every time you, depending on where you replicate the data item, essentially have to propagate the updates and invalidations. Yes. To the data items, right? yeah. So consistency could, could change your trade offs, your cost, your replication trade offs, where you, you know, how frequently you do things, where you do things, I think, as how frequently you change the objects and the new ones. Yes. Yes, definitely. But um, what I meant is that's not controlled by the policies now. It's controlled by the user. So when I create an item, I specify a level of consistency. I can even specify a bound on the number of invalidations. So there are two parameters that trigger the consistency, the conit and the sending bound. The sending bound tells me uh, how many outstanding invalidations I can have before I send them. So these two parameters are specified by the user. They are not part of the policies. Yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's on the user side when I add an item. But it would be interesting to then have also a logic that allows you to optimize on that, right? Uh, optimize on which level the user has specified and what's the optimal distribution of data 
that can guarantee that consistency level with the minimal usage of resources. I, do I answer your question? We can take off, thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, uh, why don't we uh, end it here? Okay, thank you.